Hello and welcome to Foreign Policy Focus. This is episode 125 and I am the show's host, Kyle. Foreign Policy Focus is the podcast where I discuss current events related to foreign policy and international news and then get some analysis on those events. <laughs> this show can be found at foreignpolicyfocus.libsyn.com, at the libertarianinstitute.org, or at the Facebook page, The Libertarian Union. On today's show, I'm going to be discussing a very important article written in the Daily Beast titled Strong Evidence That U.S. Special Operations Forces Massacred Civilians in Somalia, written by Christina Goldblum. The article is pretty long, but it's very in-depth. The Daily Beast interviewed dozens of people for this article, Somali politicians, a Ugandan general, generals in the Somali National Army, villagers at the site of the alleged massacre, I guess I really shouldn't say alleged massacre since pretty much now everyone admits that civilians were killed in the incident and those civilians were very likely unarmed at the time they were shot. Several of these interviews, uh, the Daily Beast sent people to Mogadishu to interview them for, you know, these were in-person interviews. So, I mean, this is a good story. This is a well-put-together story. I mean, everybody should obviously evaluate these things for themselves, but if you go through and you read the article, this isn't some hit piece, this isn't some witch hunt kind of thing. If you, if you look at what, you know, is going on with maybe a Russia gate type of scenario, that is not what this is. This is a really good piece that details the potential murder of 10 innocent people in Somalia by 10, by, you know, several American special forces. And it's, Something that, it, you know, in a just and honest world, you know, we would have a trial for. So uh, th- that's why this is so important. And the second reason that this is so important, I'll try and make these comparisons as I go through on today's podcast, is that what happened around this massacre is so exemplary of the rest of American foreign policy that it's just an indicator of why we fail every time. And I think it's very important to just highlight how much like you know whenever you under are able to understand a story like this you understand why americans foreign policy fails so many times is that continuously what we try to do is we try to force what we want on a population that just doesn't want it and it's just not gonna work so looking at this massacre it takes place in the town of barari in late august Barari is a town in southern Somalia that's kind of a haven in an area that's pretty, I believe, you know, kind of desolate. This is an area where they've had droughts and several famine, but this area is right on the brains of a river, so it does well. So they produce a lot of fruit, and then there's a lot of traders that have easy access to get it to Mogadishu. The town is not comprised of maybe one ethnic group or one uh, simple village or tribe. There's several tribes that have conflicts with each other over things I have no idea why, I how to understand them. They're just, you know, long-lasting conflicts between two groups of people. Occasionally, they take up arms and fight each other, and this is just the, kind of the way things go around Barari. For those of you who listen to this show uh, in the past, you know that Al-Shabaab is a militant group in Somalia that the United States is currently fighting a counterinsurgency against. Al-Shabaab is strong in the south of the country where Barari is, and Barari is a key town for Al-Shabaab because of the wealth of the town it's easy to extort money from it, so holding the town provides Al-Shabaab with key financial resources. When the United States first went to undertake operations to take the town of Barari from Al-Shabaab, the idea was is that taking this town from Al-Shabaab would undermine them in the region and thus be a big win uh, for the Americans there. They approached the Ugandan general in charge of the Afghan forces for the region and said, hey, this is our plan. The Ugandan general told the Americans, hey, your plan to take Barari and then hold it and provide security with SNA forces, uh, SNA, a Somali National Army, it's just not going to work. The three main reasons he gave is the warring tribes in Barari leads to confusing situations we've seen in the past, not only in Somalia, but in places like Afghanistan, where uh, maybe a a part of a tribe is approached by the Americans and said, and they say, hey, who is Al-Shabaab? And rather than pointing them to legitimate Al-Shabaab targets or, you know, saying the truth that they all know who the Al-Shabaab guys are. They point them to the warring village and say, those guys are Al-Shabaab. That village is at war, and so they, you know, have arms, and the Americans will attack that opposing village and claim that they killed 10 Al-Shabaab militants. In reality, all they killed is 10 civilians. This is a huge problem for American foreign policy because things like this 
create unknown amounts of enemies for the United States. Since the United States is claiming they're only killing militants, there's at least a a little bit of a perception difference because these people are actively at war against the United States, even if the United States is fighting them in their own country. However, if these are just local villagers, you know, defending their property from a different village, then that's a huge problem and it's going to create a lot of resistance against the Americans by people who, you know, normally wouldn't have a reason to actively resist them. And so this is, you know, one of the key reasons why the counterinsurgency isn't going to work is because you're never going to get enough intelligence to really understand what's going on in the area to actively pit the right targets to hit. Maybe if you were able to go through and just kill all the Al-Shabaab people in southern Somalia, not kill one civilian, shoot every single Al-Shabaab fighter in the head, you're going to create some more insurgents because some people are going to be so pissed that you killed their brother, even though their brother was an Al-Shabaab, they're going to go join Al-Shabaab. But you might actually be able to shrink Al-Shabaab in this manner. But the problem is, is you can't do that. And along the way, you're going to kill civilians. And every time you kill a civilian, you're going to create more and more and more members of Al-Shabaab. You're not going to just create one. It might be 10, it might be 20. It, it, It could be such a big problem that you're constantly going to be creating more enemies for yourself. So it really creates a situation where you look like, You know, look at what's going on maybe in a place like Yemen where Saudi Arabia is actually willing to do it. They're willing to starve them all to death at this point, it looks like. And that's really the only way you can win a counterinsurgency is genocide. But, you know, then it's really not a counterinsurgency, it's a genocide. Another reason that uh, it won't work is that the Ugandan general tells the Americans that the SNA army is underarmed, undertrained, and they're just not that good of fighters. And so this is another routine problem that you see when America tries to go around the world and nation build, is that whether it's in Iraq or Afghanistan or Vietnam, whenever we attempt to build an army and provide security to the people, because this is a key point of the counterinsurgency doctrine, is that you got to provide security for the people so they reject the Taliban, ISIS, Afghan, or uh, Al-Shabaab, whoever, you know, in this case, Al-Shabaab. So the idea in this case for the Americans was to use mostly the SNA forces to fight the war and then hold the city in the Ugandan general. So, there, you know, there's no way this is going to work. A secondary game, you know, that the Americans get from this is that if we say the SNA forces are fighting the war and they're the ones taking the casualties, you're going to get a lot less heat from Americans at home. If you, you know, look back and look at all the Somali National Army guys that were killed in the past year, I'm sure you have hundreds of people. I think in that when Al-Shabaab ends up overrunning the town of Barari in the end of all of this, uh, they kill 40 Somali National Army forces, troops. And so if that was Americans, this would be a huge thing in the United States. We would be demanding to know why troops are over there, why all those people are dying, and, and there'd be a huge hour. But since, you know, they're, they're, Somalis, nobody in America really cares. And the third reason was is that they were overstretched. These wars to nation build are not very popular. I think among anyone, it's not very popular to go spend your money to go help other people by shooting at them. If they don't think that you're helping them, you know, why spend your money doing it? Like if you know you're you're trying to be a nice neighbor and bring your neighbor fruit every day and then they just take it and they throw it at you you're going to stop bringing the fruit right it's a rate it's a waste of your money and they're going to throw it back at you anyway so these are very unpopular among populations in the you know empire countries that are going overseas and so typically you're not going to just have enough soldiers uh to make this all work out and that's why he told him he said we just don't have enough forces to do it the americans don't listen to the ugandan general and they go ahead and do it anyway and they're actually able to take uh this the town of barari and the surrounding area they set up four outposts around the city and there is a general an sna general in charge of i guess the the sna troops in the city of barari and this is this man by the name of shigao General Shigao, I guess, is not <laughs> described as not a very intimidating man, I believe short and round, and he seems to be quite lazy because he's approached several times to do things by people in the local village and pretty much does nothing the whole time. Shigao is also a former member of Al-Shabaab, and this is one really problematic and interesting thing that happens is that a lot of times, you know, you, you're fighting the insurgency and then people defect to your own ranks. And now you have members of Al-Shabaab within the Somali National Army. And that, you know, this to me would seem to be problematic. 
if these people are so dangerous that America has to go over a season and fight with them, you know, now we're training them and arming them. That doesn't make sense to me. One of the, I guess, maybe leaders of a local tribe, a man by the name of Dilbawi, I believe D-I-B-L-A-W-E, approaches the general Shigao and asks him to kind of resolve some of the warring problems between the two different tribes that were warring at the time. Shigao goes to the two different tribes and says, hey, everybody, let's lock your, you know, uh, you know, everybody in this tribe, you know, go lock your guns in this shed and everybody in that tribe go lock your guns in this shed and at least this prevents people from actively shooting at each other. Shiga was then supposed to start some kind of long-term resolution plan, but never did. So this leads us to the day of the actual massacre. Well, let's uh, go back a little bit. Leading The days leading up to the massacre, uh, this Diblawi uh, man, a tribal leader, notices a U.S. drone flying overhead and approaches Shigao. He says, hey, this drone's overhead. Can you go tell the Americans that there's only villagers here? The reason that people have guns is because of the warring tribe things and we'll let the Americans come in and look at everything and see that, hey, they don't have a fight with us. Shigao says, no, I'm not going to do that. And a couple more days go by, guy notices the drones again, he goes back to Shigao and says, hey, look, you you really need to do something about this, the drones are back. Again, rebuffed, uh, approaches him a third time, rebuffed again. The day after the third rebuff, around 5 a.m., villagers report hearing gunshots, and then uh, two of the witnesses that talked to the Daily Beast were drugged to the center of the town at gunpoint while their houses were robbed in order to lay on the ground next to 10 of their... Friends and family members, innocent civilians, including, I believe, one teenage boy. One of them was bleeding to death. I guess several of them were dead at the time. One of the uh, witnesses who talked to the Daily Beast, uh, a name guy by the name of Gumi Hassan, said that he asked uh, assist his friend. One of the guys, uh, military guy standing around that had detained them was a member of the Somali National Forces. He said, yeah, go to your friend. The, the American guy that was there told him not to. So what apparently happened is that at some point, these SEALs uh, allied with members of the Somali National Army that were not Sang, uh, Shigla's forces, but under another uh, SNA general who was not trained by the United States and was also a former member of Al-Shabaab. Those guys entered the village, and you know, between then and when the, the witnesses were brought forward, these 10 civilians end up dead. The village or tribal leader, Dibli, that I talked about before... Well, when he first heard gunshots, he runs to go find Shigao and say, hey, you got to go over to, you know, my part of the village or town here and, you know, help out because people are being shot. Shigao apparently moves very, very slowly, but gives uh, this guy a small number of Somali National Army forces, doesn't even go himself to go out there and resolve the dispute. When they get there, they also witness, you know, these two men laying on the ground, the two Daily Beast witnesses laying on the ground, you know, along with 10 dead bodies. At this point, the Americans and the Somali National Army forces take off. The other thing was, is that when the witnesses were first brought to the bodies laying there shot, uh, there were no guns on the ground. The Americans then went in the shed where the guns were held and put guns on the ground next to the bodies and then photographed the bodies. Some notes about this raid that I think are very important. The first is that the guns, like I said, were planted on the ground after the victims were shot. This is important detail because it says that these are very innocent civilians and so they were absolutely massacred. This wasn't even the case that these people were armed and maybe fighting against their neighbors and were mistakenly killed. But, you know, were innocent civilians that were shot. Who fired the bullets, I guess, would be the big mystery because these are the people that are guilty of murder. I believe both AK-47 shells, which were guns used by the Somali National Army, and shells used by whatever M4 or M16 variant the Navy SEALs were using, were both found on the ground, but most of the shells were found on the ground uh, were those of the Navy SEALs. I guess if, you know, you, you really, since we don't know what's going on, if they fired more bullets, it would seem that maybe they were the ones that pulled the trigger, but, you know, it doesn't take that many bullets to actually kill a civilian. The other issue for the Americans is is that this would imply that U.S. troops are a lot closer to the front lines than the United States likes to pretend or admit. Talking about before, these counterinsurgencies aren't very popular with the invading population civilians. And so, you know, just like the people being invaded, they're not big fans of the war. So we use terms like no boots on the ground, advise and assist, etc. to make it sound like American troops really aren't doing a whole lot. 
they're just teaching these guys how to shoot and how to kind of move around and conduct themselves to best fight uh, for themselves. But this clearly isn't the case here. Another big problem about the raid, like I said before, the some Somali National Army unit that went with the United States on this mission was not trained by the United States. A lot of members of the Somali National Army war. Going with a group that was trained by the United States, I think, would suggest that, one, you know, the United States knows these guys, they know how they operate, etc. But also, there would just be tactical advantages to everybody being on the same page there. The former leader of this unit was also an Al-Shabaab defector. He was a guy who didn't, who defected into when his back was up against the wall, really had no other choice. And his unit, since joined the Somali National Army, has a history of abusing American support to target civilians. And so it seemed like this would be something that's impossible, because this goes exactly against the idea of the counterinsurgency. Not killing civilians is extremely important to the counterinsurgency working. And so allying yourself with a former member of the insurgency and then going around and killing civilians with him is in no way, is, is so counterproductive to the counterinsurgency that it doesn't even make sense that you would possibly, you, you know what, how this could happen. But in a huge bureaucracy like the United States, this could absolutely happen. Since Americans only pay passing attention, even the congressmen only pay passing attention to the war, a lot of what's important here is statistics. It's very important that the Somali National Army looks like it's growing and that it's big. And so when you have 50 or 100 fighters willing to join the Somali National Army, and they're kind of well-equipped and well-trained, so you don't have to waste a bunch of money on them training them up, and they're going to be numbers on your side, then you're going to take them, because that's the way you know this all ends up shaking out. The translator used in this mission had also been used in the past and had also been believed to have given Americans bad information that led to Americans carrying out an airstrike, killing 22 militia members that were actually allied with U.S. forces. And so again, you would think, well, how could the Americans possibly ally themselves with this guy? I mean, we're the world empire, we got tons of money. But, you know, this is a huge bureaucracy that you're looking at, especially at the State Department and, you know, at the Pentagon. And so whenever you look at, you know, maybe the number of foreign speakers the United States has, it would, you know, make sense logically that a lot of these people are Russians, but it turns out that a lot of these people are actually maybe people who speak Portuguese or Spanish. And so the, the way the bureaucracies work out, it's kind of often ends up that you don't have people that are speaking the language that you need them to. So maybe they have a limited choice in translators. Also, in a lot of these remote places, you have like just a lot of different types of languages and dialects, and they're not very useful in any other context other than if you're trying to you know micromanage what's going on in that small village. And so you may you may not just have you know many selection translators, and if your forces are already overstretched, you just kind of get stuck with the guy who's willing to translate for you. And so all that just is a shining example. Of why the counterinsurgency is always going to fail. Because you're always going to go and you're always going to kill these militants. Like I said, if you go and only kill Al-Shabaab fighters, then, you know, maybe one day it might work without killing off a huge percentage of the civilian population. But it never works out that perfectly. And when you look at all the problems that were, you know, went into place in this mission, they've gone into Iraq and Afghanistan, what the United States has tried to do in Syria and Yemen and Libya. It never works. It's never going to work. And it really can't work because you're trying to force your ways on a group of people that just don't want it and don't understand it. One of the common fallouts uh, and one of the big problems with American foreign policy, other than the moral problems and the money wasted, is that it leads to something known as blowback. Blowback is when you go overseas and you bomb a country a bunch of times and then somebody from that country comes and bombs you. And in the middle of October, we had somebody attempt to do this. A suicide bomber was attempting to get into the part of Mogadishu where most of the embassies from Western countries and allied NATO stuff and African Union stuff and the, a lot of, you know, high ranking Somali people work. The suicide bomber was unable to breach the gate and was stopped detonating his bomb and killing 300 people, uh, ish in the city of Mogadishu. While it's kind of been largely considered that that man was likely a member of Al-Shabaab, the man had no history of being involved with Al-Shabaab, and Al-Shabaab hasn't taken credit for that terror attack. That man was from uh, the, the city of Bari and the surrounding area, and so you really have to wonder, and while you know, there's no direct proof, he didn't write something down, at least not to our knowledge, that, hey, I'm doing this because of the way 
the Americans killed our people in in this little village outside of Barari. Uh, that that does seem to me at least a, a very likely possibility of what happened here. And so whether it's the 500,000 Iraqi children we killed and then, you know, the blowback of the September 11th attacks or all the Americans in Iraq who die from suicide bombers or ISIS snipers in Syria or, you know, terror attacks from the Taliban in uh, Afghanistan, this is all the, the same thing. It's all the same kind of blowback. It's all these terrible tragedies that are caused by going overseas and causing the terrible tragedies to the other people first. And that's why it will, you know, never ever work. Uh, following the massacre, the, the Somali government initially said, oh, we killed some Al-Shabaab guys. Well, at that bet, uh, we we're not sure who we killed. We're launching an investigation to then admitting that civilians were killed, but that support, that report and the report that really makes the Americans complicit in the massacre has attempted to be suppressed by the American government. And so there it is, guys. I mean, this story really has all the parts and pieces and, you know, change the names and whatnot from Barari to Manja and the Taliban to Al Shabaab, and you know, it's all the same thing. It happens in different places, but it's never going to work. And so, you know, this is what I guess we need to explain to people. But understanding a story like this will really help you to understand American foreign policy. And that's why I really want to talk about it so much on today's show. Is because I guess to most people, it seems unthinkable that all these things would happen that the Somali National Army is riddled with former Al Shabaab defectors and that we use translators who have already burned us in the past and that American soldiers could ever be involved in something where civilians are killed. But all these things happen all the time. And when you understand that, then you really understand when you read a story about Syria and hear about the Americans arming Al Qaeda. You say, oh yeah, because we do incompetent things overseas. This is why this happens. And and you really start to, I think, understand it all and put it all together. So this has been really influential for me. I really write, uh, I really appreciate, I guess, that um, the Daily Beast, you know, went through all the time, effort, and I'm sure spent a lot of money on putting this story together for us. It's highly, highly important. I mean, this should be a huge deal. In American media, where we have ten, where we have you know ten to twelve U.S. soldiers maybe being involved in the massacre, ten civilian Somali citizens, an absolute murder. But you know it, it probably won't get the media attention it deserves, unfortunately. Another thing I want to mention just uh, before I wrap up the show is that the New York Times wrote a pretty decent story, uh, or ran it from Nadal Hassan about the U.S. leading to war with. I ran uh, surprisingly good, and I know I ripped on the New York Times a couple shows ago, so give credit where credit is due in writing and publishing that, uh, or Hassan for writing this story, but uh, New York Times for publishing it. All right, that's where I'll wrap up the show. Uh, the shows on iTunes, writing and review there would really help out. Website for the podcast, foreignpolicyfocus.libsyn.com. Please share it, everybody, the libertarianunion.com. Like the page. Check out the other shows on the page, Agile Anarchy, Don't Waste Your Hate, Liberty Weekly, Wizardly Wisdom, tons of great shows there. I really like all of them, and I think a lot of you will too, so so definitely check those out. The LibertarianInstitute.org, you not only can find all my podcast episodes there, but you could also find my daily news roundups that, that appear on that site as well. I'm on Twitter at K-Y-A-A-A-L-E. I don't tweet a whole lot of my own stuff, but I do retweet a whole lot of what other people do. So if you want to see some cool, funny foreign policy stuff, check it out. All right. Thanks, everyone.